Welcome to the first session of a series, I hope anyway, of spectral analysis applied to pianos. This will be an introduction, and in it we are going to look at three keys in two domains, the time and the frequency domain. And as a result, we'll get time traces and spectra, and these will pose some interesting questions about inharmonicity, pitch, and many other topics which we'll try to pursue in subsequent parts of the series. Okay, A4. I even showed you where A4 is on the compass, which I'm sure you need to know. Okay, there's the sound. And I'm showing a long-term view here, about two seconds worth. You see it uh, halves its amplitude in about uh, 0.2 seconds. This will be the pressure variation that you might sense at your ear from striking the key. Uh, there's a precursor that I can show now. There's an older version of that, but I wasn't used to it. Okay. Here's this little business right here. You, it, la it lasts about uh, two milliseconds, but it's it's ahead of the, the wave, and we'll have to we'll have to investigate that in subsequent sessions. Okay, uh, let's go back to the close-up view. Here I'm showing a close-up view. I'm showing about uh, let's see, 426 to 438 milliseconds. So that's about 12 milliseconds. And I'm showing the trace in black. You can see it's not a perfect sine wave or not a perfect 440 hertz signal because that's what I'm showing here in the thin, the thin blue line. There's some little hiccups in here that are coming from higher frequency components. But it does repeat over a period here, shown in red. This time it repeats. And it's about 2.27 milliseconds, which can be back calculated into 440 hertz because you take a thousand milliseconds per second, divide it by 440 hertz, or which also has units of 440 per second, and you end up with 2.27 milliseconds. So the fundamental period, which is this red distance here in time, is the inverse of the fundamental frequency. And this is not a blue, a perfect 440 hertz signal, which I will now play for you. Okay, let's move on and take a look at the spectrum. Here's the spectrum of that wave. I'm plotting the power at each frequency in decibels along this axis. And I'm plotting the frequency along this axis from 0 to 6,000 hertz. The blue are is the actual spectrum of the signal. And these blue peaks here are the partials. The red dotted lines are where the harmonics would occur. So, we go down here and we look at... Here's the first partial, also the fundamental, first harmonic. They all go together at 440 hertz. Here's the second, third, Fourth, and as you can see, as we get up in frequency, the partials start to get sharp relative to the harmonics. For example, right here, we see we have, uh, that is the fourth harmonic, I think, and we're sharp almost about 40 hertz, I guess. All right, and then we also uh, have some, which I'm going to call spurious peaks because it's not sure where they come from. They are awfully weak. This, these are 55 dB down. And also at around 4,000 hertz, the relationship between the partials and the harmonics tends to break away. You don't have it anymore. Now this idea of having the partials sharp relative to the harmonics is inharmonicity, and it's a consequence of dispersion, which occurs whenever you have 
transverse waves traveling through a medium that has elasticity. And the piano wire is definitely elastic, just like light waves passing through a, a uh, prism is passing through a quantity or a medium that is elastic. And the higher frequency ultraviolet light waves or the violet waves move faster than the red waves. Okay, we'll, we'll get into this a lot more later on. Uh, let's move on now and mention the fact that we can also, we can plot this at the spectrum of a variety of ways depending on what kind of insight we're interested in. Uh, here's the way we just plotted it. And down here's the way we could plot it if I plotted the square root of the power versus frequency. You can see it, it looks a lot different and it tends to de-emphasize the lower power partials. So in this particular case, I prefer decibels. However, later on, when we get into spectrograms, we'll talk about uh, using the power, plotting the power this way. OK, let's go on to the next key, which is at the other end, or down at the left end of the piano, C1. Here we go. OK, here's the long-term view. Has a half time of about 1.3 seconds. Where was it? Starts out, goes down about here. That's half time, the, the time it takes to get half of its power. Uh, it has a precursor also. And there it is. You can see there's an area, a leading up portion. It lasts about, uh, about two milliseconds, too. One point. Z 0 0.00175 seconds. Okay. Here's the short-term view, or the close-up view. And you can I see uh, repetitive nature here. I've plotted the pure 32.7 hertz wave in, in, in thin blue to show a reference point. Because you can see, here's, here's a clump. Here's another clump. Another clump here clump, and so forth. So there is a repetition here, but there's a lot of other things going on. Uh, the, the period is about 30.5 milliseconds, which is the length of this line in the time domain, and it can be back calculated to give us 32.7 hertz. In other words, 1,000 milliseconds per second divided by 30.5 milliseconds gives us back 32.7 cycles per second, or hertz. Uh, this is, as I say, clearly not a pure cycle, a pure 32.7 hertz signal. So here's what it would sound like, at least according to the computer. And also, make a final comment here that the, identifying the period of repetition is a little more difficult than it was for the A4. Okay, let's take a look at the spectrum. Now, the spectrum is quite interesting, I think. Here is the uh, first partial. You see the first partial is right on the harmonic of 32.7 hertz. Take a look at it. But it is 22 dB down. So it's quite weak. You also see, for example, that we have a uh, kind of a periodic com nature to this spectrum. Here the 8th, the 16th, and the 24th are attenuated. And that's a consequence of the fact that this key is struck at one-eighth of its speaking length, and so that particular harmonic or partial is going to be attenuated, the eighth one. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right here. There's some spurious peaks here. There's one, for example. Uh, we can see that there is definitely inharmonicity going on. We start out, these partials are located right on the harmonics, and then as we get out into, time, into space, into frequency, here, for example, we see it's sharp by about, uh, we'll say, 7 hertz. And even more so here. Here's 15 hertz. Okay, now this, 
I'm interested in this first partial being so weak, even though the, the pitch appears to be around 32.7 hertz. So let's look at another piano, and, there, and it's C1. Sounds similar, pitch-wise, color-wise, but you see this first partial is down in the mud. It's basically, let's take a look at it, but it's, uh, you can probably tell already, it's probably about 40-some dB down. Yeah, 47 dB down, if in fact this is the first partial. Because it's, there's so many things going on down here, it's mud, it's low in power. So effectively, I would say that the first partial is not present. Uh, we also see this has a different, similar structure to the last C1 in harmonicity here. We've got the partials displaced relative to the harmonics. A little spurious, a little spurious guy here. Yeah. But otherwise, uh, pitch-wise and the uh, structure of the spectrum is about is similar to that first C1 we talked about, except for the first partial. Okay, let's go up to the other end of the piano and look at the C8. Okay, that was the sound of striking the C8. See, it, it uh, drops away quite quickly. It's quite weak, and it's got a precursor here just like the other keys have. Uh, let's see what we can do here. I don't know if you can see that better or not. Yeah, let's see. Now this appears to last a little bit longer than the other keys. Now down here is the close-up view. I'm looking at uh, about well, 64.5 milliseconds to 65.1, so less than a millisecond actually. And you can see here there's a repetition period, which is the fundamental period. And let's see if we can see that. Yeah, it uh, it's related to the to the uh, fundamental, which is forty one point forty one eighty six hertz. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you here was that the, because of the sampling rate of forty four kilohertz, we only have a few samples per fundamental period. I've shown them with the little circles here. See, for example, we start here. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, a little over 10 samples as compared to C1, which had a ton. Let's see if we can go back here. Yeah, so the long term view, we have a half time. Precursor is about 35 milliseconds, it's longer. And then we can have a, a uh, sound of a pure. 4186 hertz signal that doesn't have all the other things going on with it. And there it is, at least according to the computer. We mentioned the slopes and the discontinuity. And the fact that, you know, we're sampling at 41 kilohertz of a, a wave that's got a frequency of 4186 hertz, and that turns out to about 10 samples per period, which is not very many, which means we're kind of on the edge of the available technology. Okay, here's the spectrum of that C8. Now, there's some interesting things going on here. First of all, there's a little bit of inharmonicity in the sense that the first partial is sharp relative to the harmonic. Sharp by almost 100 hertz. But the other thing you notice is that there's a lot of power in this region here up to 4,000 hertz. For example, the, uh, the C1 didn't have much region and much area in the frequency domain up to 32.7 hertz, but here we've got 4,000 hertz, and there's a lot of power in here, and that makes the sound a lot different when compared to the pure 4186 signal that we just listened to. The second thing you notice here is that the second partial out here someplace is not particularly well defined. It could be this curve, which would be it was less than harmonic, or it could be this curve, or this peak, which is right a little sharper than harmonic. But it's 30 dB down, so it's not particularly well defined. So this is a much different key than the others.
Okay, we're just about finished. We've looked at three keys in two domains, time and frequency, and uh, we've noticed some precursors, where they come from, we'll have to look into. We've noticed inharmonicity, and it'd be nice if we had a metric for that, and we do, which we'll talk about later in a subsequent session, the Q factor. Uh, we'll talk a lot about how inharmonicity, dispersion, and elasticity are related. Pitch. We mentioned pitch kind of in passing. Is there a way to measure pitch? Is there a metric for pitch? And yes, there is. We can use the autocorrelation. We notice the spurious spectral components. A lot of people think they come from longitudinal vibrations. Maybe. Uh, the second thing is that we noticed weak first partial for C1. And it turns out it happens on other bass keys too. But the pitch is appears to be, at least to my ear, maybe, near equal temperament. We'll be able to use autocorrelation later on to get some more insight into that. And we'll be able to use it to look into the rails back curve. We also will have to take another look and go back to the beginning and, and kind of compare transverse and longitudinal vibrations in piano wires and in air and just kind of get back to some of the, uh, the fundamentals there. Another question you might be thinking about is how does the line spectrum or how does the spectrum change with time? Well, we're going to use the spectrogram to look into that, and that'll give us some insight into color and bloom. And uh, the other question might be, how does the spectrum change for all the keys as you go from A0 all the way up to C8? Well, that'll bring us into maps, which we'll talk about, which also asks, how does that in inharmonicity change for all the keys? So we'll have some more maps. And then finally, We'll, can we spend some time using simulation to gain insight into inharmonicity? Okay, that's the end of it. Uh, I'd appreciate hearing, hearing from you. Here's my email address, and you can hit me with questions, comments, suggestions for subsequent sessions. And if you think this was a useful or interesting session, we recommend it to a friend. If you think it was a waste of time, recommend it to somebody you don't like. In any case, thanks for watching and listening. Maybe I'll see you in the next session.